Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam Sixth Kiyano Chapter 4 Mahamsaguya Prayers Being Offered by Prajapati Daksha. This is from the Srimad Bhagavatam, translated with commentaries by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder, Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And this is the 1975 edition, 1975 printing. It's the first edition, copyright 1975, and it's available for free download from the website krishnapath.org. So people are speaking so many things. Everyone wants to talk. They have so many things to say. That's why it's so vital, important, that every day, morning and evening, we hear from the pure devotees the glorification of the Lord and the path of transcendence, the path back home, back to Godhead. People want to talk so many things. All useless talk, not helping anyone, not helping themselves, not helping anyone. Hearing from the pure devotees about the activities, spiritual activities in the spiritual world, hearing about Krishna's name and form, his qualities, what his position is, how he can be understood, how to remember Krishna and prepare to leave this world of birth and death, old age and disease. Because these are the things that people talk about. That's all they talk about is birth, death, old age and disease. That's all they talk about in one form or another. And how they're enjoying sense gratification or how they're planning to enjoy sense gratification. All useless. Just just perpetuating the, the, the cycle of birth and death. Just perpetuating it. So this Bhagavatam is as brilliant as the sun. It's full of glorification of the Supreme Lord. So we're going to continue with our study here. And it can get pretty rough for someone practicing Krishna consciousness because coming into contact with so many different people during the course of the day that want to engage in nonsense talk. So be very, very careful. Stay focused on what is actually worth talking about and hearing about, and that's Krishna. From the lips of the pure devotees, the Vaishnavas. So this is text 31, and Daksha is continuing to offer these prayers. He didn't make these prayers up. These prayers are available in the Vedic scriptures. And he was not praying for anything material. He wanted to please Krishna. His service was to propagate the, un the universe. This is toward the beginning of the creation. His service was to propagate it as a prajapati. And things weren't going as well as they could. So he was approaching the Lord so that he could do his service nicely. So he's continuing with these prayers. Text 31. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the all-pervading Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
who possesses unlimited transcendental qualities. Acting from the cores of the hearts of all philosophers who propagate various views, he causes them to forget their own souls while sometimes agreeing and sometimes disagreeing among themselves. Thus he creates within the material world a situation in which they are able to, unable to come to a conclusion. I offer my obeisances unto him. So this is this unnecessary talking that's going on because the, the goal of the talking is not to please Krishna. It's to somehow or other um, control or uh, enjoy a position of power over Krishna's energies. You want to be the controller. They have superior knowledge. You want to be uh, very big and important and powerful. You want to be opulent. In material, uh, on the material plane. So from within the heart, these different philosophers are presenting their different views. Everyone has a view that they want to present. And But Krishna uh, causes them to forget their own souls. And sometimes they're agreeing with each other and sometimes they're disagreeing and they miss the point altogether of realization of Krishna. So he creates, the Lord does this because their desire is not to please him. So he's fulfilling all desires since time immemorial. They simply want to philosophize. They want to somehow enjoy this agreeing and disagreeing that goes on, and they never come to a conclusion. They can't come to a conclusion because Krishna is the conclusion. So Daksha, reciting these prayers, is offering his obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Commentary. Since time immemorial, it's Prabhupada's commentary, since time immemorial, or since the creation of the cosmic manifestation, the conditioned souls have formed various parties of philosophical speculation. It's not, this isn't true of the devotees. Non-devotees have different ideas of creation, maintenance, annihilation, and therefore they're called bodies, prativadis, proponents and counter-proponents. It's understood from the statement of Mahabharata that there are many munis or speculators. Tarko pratishta shutayo vibhina nasav shriyasya matamata binam. All speculators must disagree with other speculators. Otherwise, why should there be so many opposing parties concerned with ascertaining the supreme cause? Hmm. So Krishna is bewildering them like this from within the heart. Philosophy means finding the ultimate cause. As Vedanta Sutra very reasonably says, Atato Brahma Jigyasa, human life is meant for understanding the ultimate cause. Devotees accept that the ultimate cause is Krishna because this conclusion is supported by all Vedic literature and also by Krishna himself, who says, Aham Sarvasya Prabhava, I am the source of everything. Devotees have no problem understanding the ultimate cause of everything but non-devotees must face many opposing elements because everyone wants to be a prominent philosopher and invents his own way. Hmm. Yeah. They're not actually seeking the truth because the goal is to become the biggest philosopher. Not to find the truth, but to have the biggest ego false ego, <laughs> not to actually find the truth, but just to have the biggest ego. This, this contamination is found everywhere. And especially now we see so-called scientific research is funded by these different grants 
and money from these big institutions and the government. So sometimes the goal is only to get the name, fame, and the money so they can live opulently. And so the science or the research that they do becomes corrupted. They'll present false data. They'll make something up. They'll switch things around so that their theory is now proven when it's really not. So these philosophers, <clears throat> they want to be famous. They want to be known as the best philosopher, the one who came up with the ultimate cause. But they can't say the ultimate cause is Krishna because then immediately they're small. <laughs> so they come up with so many other uh, theories about the ultimate cause of supreme truth. And then they oppose each other. Each one, I know, I think it's this way. No, it's this way. And then they try to prove their theories. And in this way, they miss the point entirely. Whereas devotees don't go through that. They accept the authority of the disciplic succession, which comes from Krishna himself. And they're not competing over who, who God is or what the ultimate truth is. They accept, yes, it's Krishna. Now let us see how to surrender to Krishna. Please, Krishna. In India, there are many parties of philosophers such as the Dvaitavadis, Advaitavadis, Vaishasikas, Mimamshakas, Mayavadis, Swabhavavadis, and each of them opposes the others. Similarly, in the Western countries, there are also many philosophers with different views of creation, life, maintenance, annihilation. Thus, it is undoubtedly a fact that there are countless philosophers throughout the world, each of them contradicting the others. Boy, what a noise that makes, huh? No wonder many people who would like to know the truth they just avoid the whole subject altogether because there's all this all this commotion going on. It's not clear. It's uh, like a battlefield. And they don't even want to go near it. Now, one might ask why there are so many philosophers if the ultimate goal of philosophy is one. Undoubtedly, the ultimate cause is one, the Supreme Brahman, as Arjuna told Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 10.12. Param Brahma, Param Dharma, Pavitram Paramam Bhavan, Purusham Shashvatam Divyam, Adi Deva Majam Vibhum. Quote, is Arjuna speaking to Krishna? You are the Supreme Brahman, the ultimate, the supreme abode and purifier, the absolute truth, the eternal divine person. You are the primal God, transcendental and original, and you are the unborn and all pervading beauty. End quote. Non-devotee speculators, however, do not accept an ultimate cause, sāvakārana kāranam, because they are ignorant and bewildered concerning the soul and its activities. Even though some of them have a vague idea of the soul, many controversies arise and the philosophical speculators can never reach a conclusion. All of these speculators are envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They want to be God. They want to be the Supreme, envious. So they can never reach a conclusion. They'll just argue amongst themselves in their envy. And as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita 16, 19, and 20, Tanaham dvishata kruran samsare shu naradamam shipam yajashram asuban asurive vayonashu asurim yonim apana buddha janmani janmani mama prapyaiva kanteya tato yad mamgatim translation those who are envious and mischievous, 
who are the lowest among men, are cast by me into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life, attaining repeated birth among the species of demonic life, such persons can never approach me. Gradually, they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. End of translation. Because of their envy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, non-devotees are born in demoniac families life after life. They're great offenders, and because of their offenses, the Supreme Lord keeps them always bewildered. Kurvanti chaisyama huratmamaham. The Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, purposely keeps them in darkness. Atmamaham. If Krishna wants to protect someone, no one can hurt them. But if Krishna wants to destroy someone, no one can protect them. So this is because of their offensiveness, coming from what? Enviousness and mischievous. Let's see what um, envy, some of the more subtle meanings of envy are. I think we all know envy is you have something that I want, so I'm envious of you because you have it and I don't. So, but let's see what enviousness is. Some of the more subtle means. Look in the dictionary here. Some of the synonyms. Jealousy is going to be one. We know that. But let's see. Envy. Ah. A feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. To desire to have a quality, possession, or other desirable attributes belonging to someone else. An emotion which occurs when a person lacks Another's superior quality, achievement, possession, and either desires it or wishes it. Nice. I mean, it's not, envy isn't nice, but nice to get some more clarification. The feeling of wanting to have what someone else has, someone or something that causes envy, So that's nice to get a little more clarification on envy, what it is. To feel resentment because someone else has something that you don't have. Superior qualities, superior power, superior potency, superior beauty, superior wealth, whatever it is. A very desirable companion whatever it is that you have that's desirable that you don't have can become subject conditioned souls become subject to envy so what does Krishna do with people who are suffering from that envy or envious of him what can he do he removes them from his sends them far away In one sense, it's kind of good because if they were right there with Krishna, their envy would be inflamed and it would be such a disturbance to Krishna and everyone else serving Krishna. So by removing them, sending them far away, then it's not very nice, miserable condition, but that envy... Krishna isn't right there. So the object of their envy, they, they go into a kind of forgetfulness. They have to go into ignorance. And it's a suffering state, ignorance. And there's all kinds of material reactions. 
in the lower modes, in the lower births. But they're not right there causing a disturbance because of their enviousness. So he says they're great offenders. Because of offenses, the Supreme Lord keeps them always bewildered. So you see the demons are like that. In Krishna's pastimes, when he manifests, he personally kills them and gives them liberation. So that's great mercy. But we see how they behave. They're envious. They try to attack Krishna. They don't like Krishna. They see Krishna, and they're envious. And Krishna takes Rukmini and the other, the other princes. They become envious. They wanted Rukmini. And they attack Krishna. And Sishupal is very envious. Duryodhan was envious of the devotees of the Lord. S same principle there, envious of Krishna, envious of his devotees, envious of the Pandavas. And what was rightly theirs, their superior, pr their possession was the kingdom. They were rightly to own, have the kingdom and manage. Duryodhan was envious. He wanted the kingdom. Envious and resentful. So, so that kind of living entity develops that disease of envy, then they really can't be engaged in devotional service. They have to be supervised by the modes of material nature. And Krishna says they gradually sink down to the lowest species. Something we want to watch out for is this envy and offenses to the devotees finding fault with others in their struggles, however best they're trying to, with everyone serving Krishna, either directly or indirectly, and to start to find fault with others is a kind of enviousness. Putting oneself in the position of some kind of superior judge <laughs> the judge of others, what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong. You're the judge. So <clears throat> it's not the position for the devotee to do that. <laughs> Unless that's their service. Like Yamaraj has to judge. Oh, he did this, he did that, and then he has to find the proper punishment, unless it's actually a service. <laughs> but just to do it because it's a state of mentality is not... It's like um, fighting is a service. Arjuna was fighting, and he was killing the opposing members. But he, it, was Krishna, it was service to Krishna. Krishna was directing him to do that. But if somebody else just goes and starts killing people and shooting and everything, then you're going to get a reaction. You have to be engaged in devotional service. And then if the service involves judging others, then that's a whole other thing. But not that one takes it upon themselves to become the, what is it, judge, jury, and executioner of everybody else. It's very offensive. It's a kind of envy. Put oneself in that superior position of one's own accord. So, to be very careful of doing that kind of thing. The great authority, Parasara, the father of Vyasadeva, explains the Supreme Personality of Godhead thus. Jnana Shakti Balaisvarya Virya Teja Saseshata Bhagavat Chavda Vachani Bina Heyar Gunadibi. The demonic speculators cannot understand the transcendental qualities, form, pastime, strength, knowledge, opulence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which are all free from material contamination. The speculators are envious of the existence of the Lord, Jagadahur Anishvaram, 
their conclusion is that the entire cosmic manifestation, manifestation has no controller, but it's just working naturally. Thus, they are kept in constant darkness, birth after birth, cannot understand the real cause of all causes. This is the reason why there are so many schools of philosophical speculation. Hmm. So I ever wonder why there's so many philosophies. This is why. Because they're envious of Krishna. They say that there is no actual controller. It's just working naturally. So they're kept in constant darkness, birth after birth. Cannot understand the real cause of all causes. <clears throat> it's like they're kept in the darkness. So darkness is a kind of blindness. There's no light, you can't see. So a little example about the... There were several men who, they were blind, and but they wanted to understand what the form of an elephant was. So one man approached the elephant and touched its side and he came back and he reported, yes, an elephant is like a wall. And another, one of the other blind men went and he got a hold of the elephant's trunk, his snout. He said, no, no, the elephant is like a snake. I have personal experience, he's like a snake. And another one uh, felt the leg of the elephant. He says, no, no, you're both wrong. It's like a tree, it's a big, big tree. So they're not seeing the actual whole thing. Just maybe some little bit, a piece, some little part, and then they're arguing. No, it's like this. No, it's like that. I have personal experience. Because they're not hearing from the authority. You know, someone who has knowledge of the whole elephant and how it's all put together and what the actual form is. So that's Krishna. And these philosophers, they're in the dark. They have some little bit of knowledge here, a little glimpse there, a little glimpse there, through their own personal perceptions, their own personal meditations. And then they present the, that it's the whole truth. And that they're right and everyone else is wrong. So this is why there are so many schools of philosophical speculation. They're all in darkness. They're only getting little bits and pieces. Text 32. There are two parties, namely the theist and the atheist. So these are the prayers, that, these are the Hamsaguya prayers that Daksha is offering. be nice to know where the Hamsaguya prayers came from, who originally um, offered them. We don't have that information so far. But someone originally offered these prayers out of their realization and pure love of God. Be nice to know the history of it. Maybe we can look it up later. <clears throat> there are two parties, namely the theist and the atheist. The theist who accepts the super soul, finds the spiritual cause through mystic yoga. The Sankhyaite, however, who merely analyzes the material elements, comes to a conclusion of impersonalism, does not accept the supreme cause, whether Bhagavan, Paramatma, or even Brahman. So that's the atheist. Paramatma or even Brahman Instead, he's preoccupied with the superfluous external activities of material nature. Ultimately, however, both parties demonstrate the absolute truth because although they offer opposing statements, their object is the same ultimate cause. They're both approaching the same Supreme Brahman to whom I offer my respectful obeisances. Hmm.
So these philosophers, by seeing their different attempts, can see that it says if both parties demonstrate the absolute truth, because although they offer opposing statements, their object is the same ultimate cause. They're looking for the ultimate truth. They're just not doing it the most uh, efficient, best way, taking a very long route, very, very long route. But they're aiming for the ultimate cause. And here, this person who's offering these Hamsaguya prayers says, they're both approaching the same Supreme Brahman to whom I offer my respectful obeisances. So this, this person is a devotee, and they've taken the shortcut. They're just surrendering to devotional service, glorifying the Lord, engaging in devotional service to the Lord, hearing, chanting, remembering, worshiping, offering prayers, serving, making friends with, offering everything. So they're all struggling along this path, the theists and the atheists with their different philosophies. They're all trying to find the absolute truth. And this person says, I just offer my respectful obeisances to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> yeah, that's a shortcut. Just get right to it. Prophet's commentary. Actually, there are two sides to this argument. Some say the Absolute has no form, Nirakara, and others say the Absolute has a form, Sakara. Therefore, the word form is the common factor. Although some accept it, Ashti or Ashtika, where others try to negate it, Nashti or Nashtika. Since the devotee considers the word form, Akara, the common factor for both, he offers his respectful face obeisances to the form. Although others may go on arguing about whether the absolute has a form or not. <laughs> it's great. It's really great. The, the, the whole focal point is form. That's the focal point of the argument. Does the Lord have form or not? So the devotee doesn't worry about the argument. He just offers his obeisances to the form. Because that's what everyone's concerned about. They're focusing on the form. So the devotee, both sides of the argument, it's, it's like two sides of the same coin. So the devotee's just offering his obeisances to the coin. Is it heads, is it tails? Who cares? I mean, you can argue like that, but we do have a coin here. I think I'll just, I'll just stick with that, the heads or tails. Which side? So the form is there. They're arguing about it. And meanwhile, the devotee just offers his obeisances to the form. In this word, the word yoga shankhyaya is very important. Yoga means bhakti yoga because yogis also accept the existence. Well, how could it be? How could the devotee offer obeisances to the form when one argument is there is no form? So from that argument, then how could someone offer obeisances to something that doesn't exist? There is no form of the Lord. So you say, well, it doesn't make any sense, the sentence that the devotee considers the word form a common factor and he offers his respectful obeisances to the form. Because these things are taking place on the absolute platform, a transcendental platform. Someone who's arguing, again, because the Lord is absolute, his form is absolute. So although someone may be arguing there is no form, he's still coming in contact with the form of the Lord. He's just denying that it's there. Because the nature of the Lord is he's absolute. So devotee knows that. 
And the devotee knows that the form of the Lord, his pastimes, his name, his activities, they're all on the transcendental platform. So someone can say no to Krishna, but in effect what has happened is he said something to Krishna, even if it was just no, he has come in contact with Krishna. So saying that, oh, the absolute truth has no form, he's come in contact with the form of the Lord by saying that. It's how absolute Krishna is. Because he does exist. It doesn't depend on this atheist accepting his existence or not. There's no, there's, he has no form. He's come in contact with him. He's been offensive, he's offensive, but he's, he's come in contact with the Lord. So the devotee knows that. So they're not concerned about the argument. They're concerned with coming in contact with the form through devotional service. So they offer their respectful obeisances. The others can continue arguing. Okay, in this verse, the word yoga shankhyaya is very important. Yoga means bhakti yoga because yogis also accept the existence of the all-pervading super soul supreme soul, and try to see that supreme soul within their hearts. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 12.13.1, Janavastita tadgatenen manasa pasyanti yam yogina. Devotee tries to come directly in touch with the supreme personality of Godhead, whereas the yogi tries to find the super soul within the heart by meditation. Thus, both directly and indirectly, yoga means bhakti yoga. Thus, both directly and indirectly, yoga means bhakti yoga. Sankhya, however, means physical study of the cosmic situation through speculative knowledge. And this is generally known as jnana shastra. The sankhyites are attached to the impersonal Brahman, but the absolute truth is known in three ways, Brahmaiti, Paramatmaiti, Bhagavan Iti, Sabhyate. The absolute truth is one, but some accept him as impersonal Brahman, some as the super soul existing everywhere, and some as Bhagavan, the supreme personality of Godhead. The central point is the absolute truth. <laughs> The diff it's the different perceptions. But the central point is the absolute truth. And we hear from the realized souls, the Vaishnavas, that the ultimate realization is the supreme personality of Godhead. And these other levels of realization are gradual levels. Brahman, and that is the Sankhyites, they achieve this Brahman realization by physical study of the cosmic situ situation through speculative knowledge. So they look around through their senses, they use their mind to analyze what they're perceiving, and by very careful study like this, they come to the conclusion that everything is spirit. spiritual energy. The, sometimes the scientists are like that also, these physicists in studying the atoms, molecules, neutrons, time and space. And they come to a similar conclusion, well, everything is energy. A similar conclusion by studying like this, the cosmic situation, and then speculating So this Sankhyaite is like that. They're looking around at the material situation. It's called Jnana Shastra. And the highest realization by doing that that one can achieve is Brahman realization. 
everything is spiritual energy. And then there's the yogis who aspire to realize the super soul within the heart. They practice yogic meditations and the highest knowledge they can achieve like that is realization of the super soul within the heart of all living entities. And then there's the devotee. By engaging in devotional service, and this comes from the association of pure devotees and Vaishnavas. That's how we get the pure devotional service is through Krishna's representatives. And they make that connection through service. Serving Krishna directly is very, very rare. Though that's a, the absolutely complete pure platform. That's the eternal associates of the Lord. They, they're serving Krishna directly. Nanda and Yasoda, Arjuna, King Yudhisthira, Bhisma Dev, they're serving Krishna directly. The gopis, they're serving Krishna directly. For the conditioned souls, we go through a process of approaching a representative of Krishna who is empowered to engage others in devotional service. And that's how we engage in devotional service. Servant of the servant of the servant. Millions of times removed. And gradually make our way back to the spiritual world. And Krishna is pleased by our service. And begins to reveal himself. So this association is very important. That's why offenses are so... so... Um, detrimental. So it's like an elephant stomping down a garden. You can just picture an elephant in a garden. They just pound everything into mud and, and just by the weight of their destructiveness. So offenses are like that. They just destroy the whole garden of uh, devotion that, that's beginning to sprout, the little creeper that's beginning to sprout in the garden. So it's completely pulverized because this is the path back to Godhead dasa das anudas servant of the servant so brahmaiti paramatmaiti bhagavaniti sabdhyate how fortunate it is to come in contact with the Vaishnavas who are carrying this path back home back to Godhead and it's very, very available at the present moment on this planet due to the extraordinary mercy of Lord Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Sankirtan movement. Although the impersonalists and personalists fight with one another, they focus upon the same power Brahman, the same absolute truth. In the Yoga Shastras, Krishna is described as follows. I'm going to skip that Sanskrit. It's a little challenging. Thus, the pleasing, the pleasing appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's bodily features, his limbs, his dress, are described. The Sankhya Shastra, however, denies the existence of the Lord's transcendental form. The Sankhya Shastra says, Supreme Absolute Truth has no hands, no legs, no name. The Vedic mantras say, Apani Pado Javana Grahita. The Supreme Lord has no legs and hands, but he can accept whatever is offered to him. Actually, such statements accept that the Supreme has hands and legs but deny that he has material hands and legs. This is why the Absolute is called Aprakrita, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, has Satchitananda Vigraha, a form of eternity, knowledge, and bliss, 
not a material form. Sankhyaites or Gyanis deny the material form. And the devotees, devotees also know very well the absolute Bhagavan has no material form. So in a sense, the Sankhyaites throw the baby out with the bathwater. By distinguishing spirit from matter, can understand, yes, the Supreme Personality of God, it has no material hands or legs. He's not a material being. He's not subject to the three modes of material nature. He's the creator and the maintainer and the destroyer, ultimately, through his agents and his expansions of the material energy. So he doesn't have a mater material form, material body. That doesn't mean he doesn't have form. He's a spiritual form. So the Sankhyaites, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is the impersonal realization. Oh, this material form is causing suffering and distress and disturbance. It gets old. Um, it ca attachment to trying to enjoy through the material body it gets the birth, birth and death, birth and death over and over again, and I'm spirit. This is the impersonal realization. So therefore, the Supreme Absolute Truth has no form. Because this material form is a source of misery and suffering, then let's just throw form out altogether. Form is the problem. <laughs> they think form is the problem. Let's get rid of form. You don't want any miseries, any suffering? Well, just get rid of the form. Get rid of the personality. And you'll just have spiritual energy. Ah, no suffering. Well, that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's not the form that's the problem. It's the involvement with material nature that's the problem. It's the form in contact with material energy and being attracted to trying to engage in the material energy. That's the problem. So Krishna's form is not like that. He's not engaged with the material energy. Not that he's not engaged and doesn't have form. Ishra Parama Krishna, Satchitananda Vigraha, Nadirada Govinda, Savakarana Karanam. Translation. This is from the Brahma Samhita, I believe. Yeah. Krishna, who is known as Govinda, is the Supreme Controller. He has an eternal, blissful spiritual body. He is the origin of all. He has no other origin, for he is the prime cause of all causes. End of translation. The conception of the Absolute without hands and legs and the conception of the Absolute with hands and legs are apparently contradictory. But they both coincide with the same truth about the Supreme Absolute truth Person. Therefore, the word Vastu Nistaya, which is used herein, indicates both the yogis and the Sankhyites have faith in the reality, but are arguing about it from different viewpoints of material and spiritual identities. Parabhaman, or Brihat, is the common point. Sankhyites and the yogis are both situated in that same Brahman, but they differ because of different angles of vision. And here we are with the blind men and the elephant. They're talking about the same thing. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but one is approaching through Sankhya method of analyzing material nature, and coming to the realization that everything is spirit. And the other is arguing about the absolute truth from the viewpoint of the yogi who's meditating on the super soul within the heart of all living beings. And then they're arguing who's right. They're both right. The Lord has no arms and legs. And yes, the Lord has arms and legs. It's just from what viewpoint you're looking, a person is viewing or perceiving the absolute truth. 
from the impersonalist point of view, where everything is spirit, then the Lord has no arms and legs. Because for such a person, arms and legs means a material form. It's impersonal. For the devotee, no, the Lord has arms and legs. He's not material. He doesn't have material arms and legs. Just different angles of vision. The directions given by the Bhakti Shastra point one in the perfect direction. Because the Supreme Personality of Godhead says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhakti Mama Bijanati, translation, only by devotional service am I to be known. In translation. The bhaktas know that the Supreme Person has no material form, whereas the jnanis simply deny the material form. One should therefore take shelter of the bhakti mark, the path of devotion, then everything will be clear. Hmm. Interesting sentence. The bhaktas know. The Supreme Personality of God, it has no material form. Whereas the Gyanis deny the material form. It's interesting. Devotees know, they have knowledge, that the Lord has no material form. That leaves things open to spiritual form. Whereas the Gyanis, they just deny the material form. So they're just denying form altogether because they have no access to the spiritual form. You can't get that access without devotional service, and they haven't entered into devotional service yet. One should therefore take shelter of bhakti marg, the path of devotion, then everything will be clear. Jnanis concentrate on the virata rupa, the gigantic universal form of the Lord. This is a good system in the beginning for those who are extremely materialistic, but there is no need to think continuously of Virata Rupa, there's more than Virata Rupa, when Arjuna was shown the Virata Rupa of Krishna, he saw it, and he did not want to see it perpetually. <laughs> he therefore requested the Lord to return to his original form as two-armed Krishna. In conclusion, learned scholars find no contradictions in the devotee's concentration upon the spiritual form of the Lord, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha. In this connection, Srila Madhvacharya says that less intelligent non-devotees think that their conclusion is the ultimate, but because devotees are completely learned, they can understand that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the ultimate goal. Mm. Less intelligent non-devotees think that their conclusion is the ultimate. So it's Krishna bewildering them because there's some enviousness there. Krishna can't reveal himself when there's enviousness there. So there's still some enviousness with the non-devotees. They're trying to understand the absolute truth. But because of the envy, not wanting to wanting uh, or feeling with resentment that someone has something better that, that they can't have. It doesn't belong to them. It belongs to Krishna. All opulence, all wealth, all strength, all beauty, all knowledge, all renunciation. Those are Krishna's qualities. They can have a little bit they can have some opulence and some beauty and some strength, some wealth, but not all of it. 
the Krishna is belong everything belongs to him. So they don't like that position. They want all of it. They want to be have all knowledge, all strength. They want to be Krishna. It's not possible. Krishna has that. And separate individuals, living entities, everyone's individual. So by accepting Krishna's superior position, one becomes protected by Krishna. Becomes peaceful. Can experience their their own good qualities. But by remaining envious of Krishna, someone who is superior, then they become more and more diminished in their own good qualities. Become more and more diminished. He's cutting himself off from the source. Because Krishna's he's the possessor of all good qualities. The and he's the source of all good qualities. So by being envious of Krishna, you begin to cut oneself off. You begin to cut, cut, yourself, cut myself off from the source of my own good qualities, which is Krishna. So in this regard, Mahavacharya says, less intelligent non-devotees think their conclusion is the ultimate. Why do they think that? Because they want to think that. Their goal is to have the ultimate conclusion, not the truth. They think their happiness will come from having the ultimate conclusion. That they're the ones with the ultimate, they're the ones with all knowledge. They think their happiness will come from that. But because devotees do have the full knowledge, and they can actually understand what the ultimate goal really is. It's not to become the one with the ultimate knowledge. <laughs> it's to surrender to the one with the ultimate knowledge. <laughs> and this realization, this surrendering process, comes by association with those that are situated in this way. That's the value of that. That's what that makes the difference for the aspiring transcendentalist is the association. These are called Vaishnavas, Vaishnavacharyas, who are situated on this platform where they do have knowledge of the ultimate goal and they are engaged in transcendental devotional service. And they can give that to others and there's no other way to get it. Krishna's arrangement <laughs> 